going to take you on a virtual tour of the Loop Canal system. We are going to take a look at where it starts, where it ends, and several places in between. So let's get started. First we need to take a little drive from Columbus. We head northwest out of town on Highway 81 and then turn west onto Highway 22. We drive through the towns of Monroe and Genoa and then even a little farther. It is about 30 miles from Columbus to the beginning of our tour. This is the Loop River. Some quick background information about the Loop River. It begins in Howard County, Nebraska, not far from Grand Island, and ends about four miles southeast of Columbus, where it joins the Platte River. This particular location along the Loop River is five miles west of Genoa, Nebraska, and this is where the Loop hydroelectric system begins. It is called the Headworks. This is called a diversion weir. It is a dam or wall that was built to divert the Loop River water into the inlet structure that leads to the Loop Canal. Here you can see the inlet structure that leads to the Loop Canal. You can see the water as it enters into the gates. Not all the water is diverted into the canal. Some of the water will continue down the Loop River where it will eventually join with the Platte River near Columbus. On this particular day, there's not a lot of water left in the river past the diversion weir, but that varies depending on the amount of rain we received and things like that. This is the canal side of the intake structure. The water flows from the Loop River side through these gates and out into the canal. These gates open and close to regulate the amount of water that is taken into the canal. The gates may be operated by electrical power, gas power, or even by hand when necessary. In the winter, these gates will freeze and the workers have to use steam to melt the ice off in order to operate them. The normal intake for the canal is 3,000 CFS, or 3,000 cubic feet per second. At this point, the water is running very fast. As the water enters the canal, it carries a lot of sand, silt, and debris with it. This is something that has to be dealt with before the water can help generate electricity. Here you can see the water flowing into the first part of the canal, known as the settling basin. The first two miles of the canal is called the settling basin. It is wider and not as deep so that the flow of the water can slow down and the silt, sand and other debris can settle to the bottom. The sand and silt that has settled to the bottom is removed by something called a dredge. The loop's dredge is named the Pawnee and it runs 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in the spring and the fall. Can you see the tube-shaped apparatus connected to the back of the dredge? That hooks up to the pipes on the sides of the canal. There are 15 pipes on each side that can be connected to the dredge. We'll just say that the dredge works as a kind of big complex vacuum that sucks up the silt and sand and things like that from the bottom of the settling basin and it sends it through these pipes that are on either side of the canal. And this is the end of the pipe that the sand comes out of. That sand comes out onto this huge 400 acre sand pile. This sand pile is about two miles long, half a mile wide, and between 40 and 90 feet deep depending on which end you are on. 
Now that's a lot of sand. On this other end of the sand pile, you can see a company which is called Preferred Rocks of Genoa. What they're doing is they're taking out a specific kind of sand from the sand pile called frac sand. Then they sell this to the gas and oil industry. But that's an entirely different lesson. Just think, a sand pile that you can drive bulldozers on. That's pretty impressive. You may remember I said that they run the dredge just during the spring and the fall. You may be wondering, why don't they run the dredge all year long? Well, I'll tell you. I think you know why it doesn't work so well in the winter time, right? But in the summer, they stop for a very special reason. Two types of birds that are considered threatened or on the endangered species list make their home during the summer on that huge sand pile. They are the interior least tern and the piping plover. They make nests, lay eggs, and hatch their babies right there. If the dredging goes on, it is possible that the nests and eggs could get buried, so the dredging stops until the birds leave in the fall. This is called the skimming weir. This structure keeps large debris from moving into the canal from the settling basin. This is technically the beginning of the upper power canal. From this point, the water travels about 11 and a half miles towards the Monroe Powerhouse, but it will encounter some interesting twists and turns along the way. Obviously, there is a need for bridges across the canal. The canal actually travels under approximately 50 bridges from beginning to end. But there are some times that the canal actually has to be diverted underground instead. Here are some examples. And this is beaver pit siphon. And what this siphon does is um, it takes the water underneath the highway and it takes the water under, or the canal water underneath the highway. At this location, the canal encounters a highway. Instead of using a bridge, a siphon was used so the water goes underground, under the highway, and comes out on the other side. A siphon is a large concrete box-shaped culvert. Let's take a closer look at a different siphon. This is Looking Glass Creek, which crosses paths with the Loop Canal. Since Loop didn't want to interfere with the flow of the creek, they made a siphon to take the canal underneath it. Here the water is entering the concrete culverts that form the siphon. You can see the top of the siphon underneath this bridge. You can see the water in the creek flowing across the top of the concrete siphon and then it continues on in its normal course. And now here's the canal water back at the surface after its journey underneath the other creek and underground. You can tell by looking how strong the current is in this location. This would not be a safe place to be in the water. So you will see signs like this posted in various places along the canal. Here the canal reaches its first major destination, the Monroe Powerhouse. The Monroe Powerhouse is called a run-of-the-river plant. What that means is the natural flow and the elevation drop of the water is what causes the turbines to spin so that the generators can produce electricity. There is about a 32-foot drop between where the water enters on this side of the powerhouse and where it exits on the front side of the powerhouse. On the left-hand side, you see a large rectangular opening. This is called a tainer gate. If they do not want to produce electricity at this plant at a given time, they can bypass the generators through the tainer gate. You can also see that garbage and other debris 
can gather around in front of the powerhouse. There are traps below where the water is entering which catch the debris to keep it from entering the turbines. This rake apparatus is now cleaning the debris out of the traps. This is what it looks like inside the Monroe Powerhouse. The generators that produce the electricity are housed inside these casings. And as you can see, there are three of them. You cannot see the turbines that are located below that grate being put into motion by the water. The rotation of the turbine causes the shaft to spin. It is rotating at 112 and a half RPMs. Here is a view of the shaft from the bottom where it is connected to the turbine all the way to the top where it is connected to the generator. The Monroe Powerhouse generates about 20% of the Loop Public Power District's total electricity generation. Here are some pictures of the many gauges, controls, and monitors at the Monroe Powerhouse. While people do work at this location, it is possible for the Monroe Powerhouse to be operated by remote control through computers at the Columbus Powerhouse. This is the side of the Monroe Powerhouse where the water exits and continues on its journey down the canal. You can see the substation on the right where the electricity flows out onto Loop's electrical network. From Monroe, the canal carries the water another 13 miles towards Columbus. The section between Monroe and Columbus is called the Lower Power Canal. Generally, the canal is 100 feet wide and 20 feet deep. The water travels at a speed of 2 feet per second. This bridge, located 3 miles north of Columbus on 48th Avenue, may look familiar to you. This footbridge, known as Kastner's Crossing, connects two of Columbus's recreational trails. It is also a sign that we are near the end of the Loop Canal. At this point, the Loop Canal merges with the tail end of Lake Babcock. Take a close look at the rippling of the water here. This is called Sawtooth Weir. Again, a weir is a structure that helps direct the flow of water. The zigzag of the sawtooth pattern helps to slow down the speed of the flowing water as it enters the tail of the lake. So now the water that started out in the Loop River by Genoa is now here in Lake Babcock and Lake North. They are known as regulating reservoirs and they can store water temporarily until it is needed to generate electricity at the Columbus Powerhouse. These lakes have enough storage for 48 hours of emergency hydro generation. Next, we see the intake canal that flows between the lakes and the Columbus Powerhouse. The intake canal is one and a half miles long. At the end of this short trip, the water will enter the gates of the intake structure that you can see here. Here we are standing above the gates, looking north out at the intake canal. Looking down, you can see the water as it enters the gates.
As we turn and face south, we can see how the water gets from the canal to the powerhouse through these three giant tubes. Okay, tube is not the correct terminology. They are called penstocks. Each penstock is 20 feet in diameter and approximately 300 feet long. The water drops 112 feet and it is the force of that falling water that causes the turbine gates to move which makes the turbine spin and drive the generators to produce electricity. The inside of the Columbus powerhouse looks very similar to the one we saw in Monroe, only bigger. It also has three hydraulic turbo generators, but in this facility, the turbines spin at 150 RPMs instead of 112 and a half. The Columbus Powerhouse is one of the largest hydroelectric generation plants in the state of Nebraska. The Columbus Powerhouse is the pulse of the hydro system. Operators are on duty around the clock, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They keep in contact with the MPPD Central Dispatch Office to determine when and how much electricity is needed. All this equipment must be taken care of. When maintenance needs to be done, they might use this 75 ton crane or these enormous tools. The water has once again finished doing its job of producing electricity and now it exits the Columbus Powerhouse. It goes into the Tail Race Canal and it's on its way to its final destination, the Platte River. This is the Platte River and to the right we can see Tail Race Canal as it merges into the Platte River. The length of the Tail Race Canal from the Columbus Powerhouse to this point is five and a half miles. This little waterfall is another concrete structure called the Outlet Weir. The water from the canal flows over the weir into the Platte River. The concrete wall also prevents backflow from the plat into the canal. Finally, the water continues on its natural course down the Platte River. If you remember, the water was originally in the Loop River, but because the Loop River has already merged with the plat upstream a few miles, this is where the water would have ended up anyway. It just took a different route. The entire canal system is 33 miles long and drops in elevation approximately 165 feet from where it started at the Genoa Headworks to where it re-enters the river. So that's the loop canal system from the beginning to the end. I hope you enjoyed the tour.